Welcome to a fisherman's world. There's no doubt that the most productive fishing trips are the end result of a lot of careful planning. And often as not, they end up being nothing more than darned hard work. After a few trips like that, it's nice to just take the four-wheel drive, load it up with tackle, grab a couple of close friends, and head off in search of some new territory. Having fun is about the only thing I'm prepared to guarantee out of a trip like that. As far as the fishing goes, it's pretty much a matter of taking pot luck. This is the sort of country dreams are made of. Long, magnificent beaches linked by a succession of headlands stretching north and south as far as the eye can see. You can reach sections of it with a conventional vehicle, but if you want to see all of it, you need four-wheel drive or a good beach bike. This section of the coast was new to us and the first afternoon was spent checking out likely beach formations for a serious fishing effort the next day. The top bait on any east coast beach is beach worm. They're easy enough to catch once you get the knack of it. Trouble is, it takes about 50 years of solid practice to get the knack of it. The system is simple enough. You just burly the wash on the half tide with some old fish, and when the worms put their heads up out of the sand, you walk down and pull them out. If you want to keep beach worms for any period of time, the best way to catch them is with your fingers. They're easier to catch with pliers, but you can end up with a lot of heads if you don't do it right. The important thing with any bait collecting exercise is to take only as much as you need. Conservation is something we all need to practice. You can keep these worms in good condition for days if you just dust them off with dry, cool sand and store them in a cool place. If you feel you need a tonic to pick you up, this could be it. It really does things to me to watch the sun come up on a deserted beach. Fish or no fish, it's a special experience and always one of the best parts of a fishing trip. And maybe it's just as well catching fish wasn't important because we sure weren't doing much of it. 
a huge sea and an influx of carpet weed had closed the beach scene down completely. It seemed like a good idea to leave the beaches for a few days to give the sea a chance to go down and the fish time to work their way back into the gutters. We thought there might be some fish around the headlands if we could find a sheltered spot and so we went back to our bait collecting activities. This is called the pippy twist. It's a way of collecting pippies and reducing your hip line at the same time. The pippies bury in a few inches under the sand and catching them is just a matter of doing the pippy twist until your toes get cut on the shell. It takes a few days to get the activity wired in a strange area. Sometimes you get lucky and stumble on the fish right away, but mostly it's a matter of checking out all the possibilities, one at a time, until you strike it rich. Our next move would be to check the headlands, but for the moment we had more pressing matters to attend to. ago a fish barbecue breakfast had seemed like a pretty good idea but with the creel as empty as our stomachs it's time to be grateful for a camp cook who is a born pessimist the whole secret to cooking sausages is in the way you put them in the grill this is the wrong way I always feel that a little sand and a few splinters adds a lot of character to the humble sausage Well, you know how it is with the smell of an open fire barbecue. By the time those sausages finish cooking, they'll be worth $10 each to hungry men. Hygiene is terribly important when you eat out of doors. You always have to remember to give the bait knife a good wipe before you cut food up with it. And with that little chore out of the way, it's time to start working for our next fish dinner. The next move, to check out a few headlands for fish, or more correctly, a place to fish. With slippery grass under the tyres, our four-wheel drive was really doing a fly-on-the-wall trick getting down some of these slopes. The fishing may not have been very exciting, but the driving was sure making up for it. In two days, we found enough great fishing territory to keep us busy for a year but there was no way to fish any of it in these conditions. The weather was brilliant, but out over the horizon, Lord Howe Island was in the grip of a cyclone, and the huge ground swell was travelling across hundreds of miles of ocean to batter our coastline. With the swell coming straight out of the east, it was impossible to find a lee anywhere, and some of those waves were peaking at 15 feet before breaking on the rocks. to exercise a little discretion 
and move off in search of quieter waters. Well, you could hardly call the first part of our expedition a howling success, but at least we were learning a lot about when not to fish. With the beaches and rocks out of the running for the moment, we decided to try a different approach altogether and went looking for a nice, quiet creek and the one fish you can nearly always rely on in a pinch, the flathead. Almost any coastal creek will have a resident population of flathead right throughout the year but the summer months are the best time for them. The most consistent way to catch big flathead is with live bait, but it's a lot more fun when you work with lures and ultralight spinning tackle. You may not catch as many, but it's a nice active form of fishing. On the high tides, the flathead move up into the warm shallows of the sand flats and are difficult to approach. But on the run out, they congregate along the edges of the channels to hunt the small bait fish coming down with the tide, and this is the time to fish for them. You can catch all sorts of fish spinning lures in these little creeks. Joe finds himself locked in combat with a dreaded pike, the only fish in the sea that can stay asleep with a hook in his mouth. Wayne's fish is the right kind. This is about average for a creek like this, but we did have one fish of about 15 pounds follow a lure right to the bank without striking. This is not the recommended way to handle a flathead. Wayne is the only person I know who can do this without being spiked by the spur on the back of the gill cover. One of the nice things about this form of fishing is that it doesn't demand a great deal of skill. If you work the lure close to the bottom and have the patience to keep on casting, sooner or later a flathead will tag the lure. We were only using four pound line here, but it's plenty strong enough for flathead. The fine line has the advantage of allowing long casts with very light lures, and that's more important than being able to drag fish out of the water quickly. I think I'll leave that fancy grip to wane. I need all my fingers. A lot of fishermen find it hard to believe that brim and blackfish occasionally hit these small lures, probably only out of curiosity. And here's a good example of the lucky dip side of spinning. A mullet, fair hooked, right in the lip. 